morning. Good morning. So as uh, Eva mentioned, I'm not preaching alone yet. Thank you, Enrique. I'm preaching with beautiful Becky today. So it's a duel. Two for the price of one. You're going to be filled today to the brim. And it's going to be great, all right? You're in good hands. You're in good hands. Becky's supporting me, keeping me in line, keeping me in check. And I'm doing the same for her. And it's going to be great. It's so wonderful to be here, you know, with you all. Whenever I get to share, it's such a great privilege. And I, I just enjoy doing it, all right? And you guys are wonderful. Everyone looks amazing. Just, I mean, just confirm it. You tell your neighbor, actually, you look all right. Yes. God is good. God is good to us. We look all right. We look amazing. John, are we ready to go? So, what is it? What is it? What is it that we don't get enough of? What is that thing that keeps us all up at night? That when we wake up in the morning and we go to the mirror and we look at ourselves, it begins to speak to us. And you go out and you want to go to work, you're on your way to work, it meets you there. At work, it is there. You come back, get on the bus, and you find it there. You want to hang out you know, with your friend in the pub, you know, and then you begin to share rates with your friend in the pub and sometimes in the coffee shops. In school, it is right there with us. What is it? What is it? And you are asking the question already. Even here in church, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> This morning, you know, we have a little bit. Thank you, Brother Simon. That was wonderful. Yes. You know, the ending part was a little bit, you know. Uh, it was new. <laughs> no, not too new because we've done it before, but we've not done it in a long time. And some of you that have never heard that kind of sound before, you're already asking your question. Oh, my goodness. What am I supposed to do? Should I move to this reggae bit? Have I got the body for it, you know? I don't want to be too cringy. I'm, I'm up to, I'm straight. I'm, you know, so I'll just close my eyes and pray. <laughs> it is right here with us. Since morning, in the next 45 minutes, I want to share with, uh, to work with us about this thing. This thing that is called complaining. Okay. Oh. All right. We're going to be exploring about that thing that is so embedded in our culture that is called complaining, dissatisfaction. But there is a twist at the end that there is actually a way that we can do this right. But sometimes we can get it wrong. And we're going to get help today. You know, we're not just going to be speaking from we, none of us. Becky, haven't studied any psychology, have you, anything? No? Sociology? No? You know? So we, have, we don't have any background. So we're going to depend on what the Bible says. Because we have a lot of Bibles in our house and we read it. And we found out what the Bible says about the subject, about complaining. We will learn from the children of Israel. Now, if you know, we all have a certain kind of idea of where we've been. You know your history, you know your past. And you know, you have an idea of where you are going, probably, not all the time, but there is a sense of the future that we have, all right? But the life in the middle that should get us from here to there is a huge question mark. It is full of surprises. These things, they might look in line, you know, you can get from here to there. But then there is this pulpit in the way. There is a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, we might end up going behind the drums. It is quite tight behind there. And, you know, how can we get our way? You know, there is a future, you know, because God has promised us what? That there is, his plans is to prosper us and not to harm us. So there is kind of an idea, you know, for a Christian, we all know that. There is a better day. There is a better future. My future is bright. My future is good. 
You know, God is going to bless me. There is a heaven waiting for me. There is all the success and all that. You know? So we can see it because the promises are there. But getting from here, from the thing that we know, oh, this is my life history, this is what happened to me in the past, and getting to there, it is sometimes not an easy journey. Can we confirm it? <laughs> and it is on a daily basis. And God has left us with a responsibility. He said, you know what? I have that promises I've given you there. Now we're going to be making some decisions together along the way. As we go. As we travel this route with you. We're going to be making some decisions. I'm going to be, I'm going to be talking to you. You're going to be talking back to me. And we're going to figure this out. We're going to go together. All right? So he left us with this responsibility that we have the power in our mouth to keep declaring the future. That from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And our words have the power to create the future with God in it. But then there is a problem, as we will learn, that the children of Israelites complained in their journey to God and it cost them a lot. Some of them didn't even end up seeing the desired future, the promised land, the beautiful land. They left slavery and all that, but they couldn't get to that journey, to the end of it, because of one of the seven, as the Bible says, the seven deadliest sin of complaining and grumbling. It's going to be fun, I tell you guys. It's going to be good. You're going to be all right. <laughs> You're going to be all right. All right. So we're going to read our first text. All right. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned amongst them and consumed some, some of the outskirts of the camp. When the people cried out to Moses, he prayed to the Lord, and the fire died down. So that place was called Teberah, because fire from the Lord had burned amongst them. Fire from the Lord has burned, burned amongst them. Now these guys, you know, the children of Israelite, at this point, we don't even know what they're complaining. But the Bible told us that they were complaining about a certain issue. Now if you remember their history... If you remember where they came from, you know that God performed all sorts of miracles before their eyes. You know of the ten miracles that he performed before Pharaoh led them out of Egypt to the point that they were at. They've been a journey, you know, on this journey they have seen a lot of miracles. In fact, we know of the famous one, don't we? Of the parting of the Red Sea. Where God opened up the Red Sea, you know, for them to walk through on dry lands. That is amazing for the sea to open up for you to walk on dry, on dry land now i can imagine like i'm trying to picture it like you know moses and the children of israel like um, millions of them they were walking and they came you know and they were like confronted with the red sea and behind them was the egyptians and they stood there and they were looking they were not looking to god you know they were looking to moses they turn, you know, you can imagine, you know, put yourself in the situation. What would you ask your leader, you know, who has led you, you know, on this journey and then all of a sudden, uh-oh. You will come to me and ask, what's the plan, sir? <laughs> what's the plan, ma'am? What, well, I mean, have you got any plan? And, you know, sometimes leaders don't always have the ideas, all the answers. You know, so their complaining started right from the word go, all right? They stood there and they asked Moses, okay, why did you take us out of Egypt in the first place? This is to Moses. Are there no enough grave in Egypt that you took us out to come and end here? Why? But, I mean, I'm like, Come on, guys. Death is death. In Egypt or on the, in the front of the Red Sea, it's still the same thing, isn't it? No, but they, they fancy that complaining, that there is a past that they sometimes always want to go back to. Whilst God was edging them forward, God was merciful. 
And if you look in your life, you know, you will see that God has been merciful to you in a lot of ways. And how far you have come. He is faithful and he parted the Red Sea for them to walk through. I was looking, you know, on a research and found out, you know, why do people actually complain? Why do we actually complain? And one of it is that, you know, we, we complain because it's a good conversation starter. You know, like, because we can be, we can be awkward and we, you know, like, socially, you know, uh, what, what, what's the, uh, I'm meeting you for the first time, and we're in church and we're meant to be friendly and we're like, <laughs> hello. hello, yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Horrible weather today, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we will have something to talk about. You know, it is a good conversation starter. And you know, the second thing is that, is that it has become so habitual that sometimes we don't even know that we are doing it. It has become so familiar with us, it was, you know, and it has become part of us that we don't even know that we are complaining. And then the last thing is that it validates our beliefs. It validates our belief. Oh, oh, my life, goodness gracious. I know it. This is so me, isn't it? To fail is so me. I will never be liked, you know, by these people. I know if they know me a little bit, they will not like me. My life is a mess. I'm a victim of this life. A lot has been done to me. So we do not, you know, it validates, you know, we reinforce, you know, some negative things around, uh, you know, about our lives. And every little thing just trigger it. And we go to it and we're like, this is just it, you know. We just complain and complain about it. Now we read in the text that the fire of the Lord burns, you know, in the outskirts. And something that we can learn from there is that complaining actually is tears up something in God's heart that doesn't please him. And we said today, you know, nowhere, no place I'd rather be, you know, um, set a fire here in my soul. So the fire of God can be an amazing, a good thing. You know, if you put metal, you know, in fire, if, you know, you can shape that metal into whatever thing you want. But if you put, you know, wood in the fire, it burns it out. So if you come to God, you know, with a with, with, uh, complaining spirit, that, you know, it doesn't really, God causes God to bring out the gold in us. Because the fire can purify it, and it purifies us at the same time. So the fire, it behaves in accordance to our attitude. What is our attitude? God's response was just and perfect, you know, in every situation because he knows your past and he knows your future and he knows your right now. And he is making decisions with you on the way because he knows where he wants you to go. So this is the point I'm gonna introduce the amazing Becky. So the next bit, we know what the Israelites are complaining about. So I'm gonna read to you the verse. The rabble with them began to crave other food and again the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. So we know they're craving some other kind of food and we know they're complaining about food. So it's gone from just regular complaining to now, okay, we're craving something, we're, compla we're complaining because we are hungry and we want something different. And the funny thing is, it's thinking about how, how do we remember our history? How do we think about the things in our past? The Israelites here are thinking about the food that they used to eat before they left Egypt. And I know that there's times in my life when, yeah, I, I look back and I think about a memory um, often life doesn't go the way we think. What Manzik was saying about here in the middle, this is 
the unknown. Yes, we know the past, we can look back to the past. This bit is the unknown. We don't, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. I don't even know what's gonna happen in two minutes. I might trip over, I might fall, you know, who knows? But, and I might know a bit of the future, but right now I don't really know what's gonna happen. And God is saying, there's a brilliant quote actually that says, I think I've got it on here. We tend to exaggerate, over-exaggerate the past, underestimate the present, and overestimate the future. So in over-exaggerating the past, the Israelites here are forgetting maybe some of what God's done to them, the fact that they even have this manna that they can eat, that they have just enough to live off in the time. And I'm gonna use this illustration. This is me and Nanzik on our wedding day about four and a bit years ago. We look happy, we are happy. We had such a great day, it was amazing. We couldn't stop dancing, we couldn't stop smiling. It was one of the best days of my life. There was joy, there was, you know, amazing excitement in preparing for the wedding and, uh, you know, going on our honeymoon and, oh, this is a new thing, we get to live together, we get to do life together, it's amazing. But behind a lot of that, when I go back now sometimes, I go back to the past, maybe I'm having a bad day or things aren't quite working out for me, I might think, why can't I go back to this better time? Like, I wish I could go back to that time when we were married or we were engaged or whatever. And... I forget about some of the maybe not so great bits because it's mixed, life is mixed. Our memory, we over-exaggerate the past and we can think, oh, I wish I could go back, I wish I could change, you know, go back to that and be how I was back then. I wish I could be slimmer. I wish I could be, you know, I wish I didn't spend all that money I had back then. <laughs> but actually, in, the, in this photo, there was a lot of stress. We went into debt. We... Nanzit got angry at me because I was like 45 minutes late to the wedding. Then after the wedding, after the wedding, I wanted to go back to my parents' house to sort out, sort myself out. I took a little bit too long, so our guests were waiting. Nanzit was getting, you know, annoyed. So you don't see that in the picture. You don't, when, you're, when you're thinking about the moment, you don't think about those things. And, you know, even, even in myself, I wasn't 100% well in myself. I struggled with mental illness. And actually, that picture wouldn't tell you that I'm struggling. You see a happy girl, you see a happy man. You don't know the history that's got us to the where, to where we said I do, you know? And so when I think back, actually, there's a lot, there's a lot more to it than just, that was an amazing time. I wish I could go back. I wonder if you've got a memory or a time in the past that you look back to and you wish and you feel as though that time is better or easier. Why did it all have to change? The Israelites here forgot what God had done. They forgot that he had provided in an amazing way this manna that Nanzit's going to talk to you about in a minute. And actually, it, it tasted all right, like it was good. It helped them to survive, to get from A to B, from where they needed to go. And it might have been unexpected. They didn't know they were going to get this manna because God provided it right then and there at the time of their need. But yet they complained. They forgot that in Egypt they were enslaved. What about all the whipping? What about the taskmasters that were driving them? That, you know, what about all the, the sons, the firstborns that died at the time of Moses' birth? When Pharaoh was like, I'm just going to wipe every firstborn son out. That is suffering. That is loss. And yet they're thinking, oh, because I'm hungry, I'm going to start complaining to my neighbour. Because God, yeah, like, what's he done? The irony of the verse is almost like him saying, we loved being in bondage. We loved being slaves and treated badly. You know, we'd rather be back there than in this abundant blessing, but they're not seeing the blessing. I'm gonna pass you back on to the Lord. Quite interesting, isn't it? You know, that we sometimes easily forget, you know, what where we were at and where we begin to look back and complain about the present and things not working, no, it's not going right. Whilst God is saying there is an abundance of blessing for you right here and right now. Think of even the breath that you take. Every breath that you take, it is a free gift that says you are still alive. And your life is a gift right here and right now. So sometimes you look back and then we forget, really, 
You know, all the things that happen and think, oh, my life when I was in the world, I was a rock star. You need to meet me then. I was great. I was amazing. You don't mess with me in my past. But you forgot that sometimes it wasn't all that. It wasn't all that great when you really think of it. That sometimes there are times that you stay up all night crying. Where is my life headed to? I don't have any hope. Is this how I'm going to end? Is this where I'm going to be all my life? But God took you up, cleaned you up, polished you out, and put you here. And because the prayer or something is not answered as we want, we then start thinking of our past. It's so funny, I was listening to this verse in, in audio Bible in the car, and Isaiah was with me in the van, and then as he was reading, and you know, the narrator started, you know, kind of, let's go back, um, you know, listing, you know, the kinds of food, you know, that they had, you know, over there, and you know, see, cucumber, and Isaiah was cucumber, <laughs> and then garlic, garlic, <laughs> olive, oil, olive oil, you know, and I'm like, he is shocked as well that they are complaining about this kind of food. <laughs> Who cares about vegetables these days? These guys were in the past. We are in heaven now. When we begin to talk about what manna actually looks like. Oops. What was that all about? <laughs> that the manna was like coriander seed and looked like raisin. Ah, we love raisin. It has something sweet in it. People went around gathering it and then ground it into hard, uh, um, sorry, ground it in a hand mill and crush it in a mortar. They cooked it in a pot or made it into loaves and it tastes like something made with olive oil. Then the dew settled in their camps at night, the manna also came. It's just an example of what you can make with manna. Come on, look at that glaze. So nice. You know that this manna wasn't only delivered right in front of their doors that they don't even have to go to the mall or to the marketplace. They don't have to work hard to earn some money to be able to buy it. They just need to walk out in the morning and fetch it and get what they need. All right? They don't even need to put it in the fridge, you know, to store it, you know, to save it for the next day. That God is saying, there is provision for you tomorrow. Just get what you want to eat today. Get enough for today. That this manna was so versatile, you can make it into all sorts of things. And it has all the nutrients to sustain them for 40 years. Hey, it will keep you healthy. All right? You don't need to add any more supplements when you eat manna. Because it has all the nutrients you need in it. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Yet they still complained. David told us, you know, in Psalm 78, that they ate the grain of heaven and the bread of angels. <laughs> you know, today we say we're going to have a feast in heaven. You know, we can't wait. We can't, you know, we're trying to imagine what it would look like in heaven, what it, would that banquet look like? Well, they have had a taste of it. They ate the bread of heaven. Yet, they complained. God cares about every detail of their life. He cares about every part of them. You know that even their clothes did not wear out. Their feet from the long journey did not swell looking after them, caring for them, yet they still complain. What this would teach us is that, you know, that there are people that, you know, it almost becomes so part of them. You know, it becomes so part of us. Even I remember when we were exploring this verse, you know, kind of working on this sermon with Becky, one day, you know, she came back, can I share? You don't know what I'm about to share. <laughs> you know, she came back home, you know, and I was busy studying, you know, and like writing, jotting things out, down, and you know, man, you're, you're in the zone, and you know, and I was doing that, 
And then she came in and, you know, from her wherever and walked in, went to the, you know, that, 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 you know, the uh, snacks box, got some crispy kind of things, popcorn, and then she came and sat right by my side <laughs> and she was eating her popcorn and crunching it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, we have only two days to this summer, and what in the world are you doing? You're disturbing me right now. And I was like, Becky, can you finish that popcorn quickly, please? And you know, I don't like the noise that is coming out of you right now. <laughs> and oh, well, I don't like the way you're sitting right now. <laughs> and eye for an eye, we're talking about the Old Testament. <laughs> You know, <laughs> complaining, you know, it's, it's in everyone. <laughs> Even when you're going to talk about complaining, you, you know, the only thing it does to us right now is that it reflects, it reflects me more. It reflects us more. That when you think, you know, you, be, you begin to see yourself in the stories of these people. That you, you are living in abundance. That if you're here right now, if you have a smartphone on you right now, and you can you, you have internet that you are better than over 90 percent of the world you are somewhat in such a life that everyone is you know around the world is striving to have that you are in a good place you are in someone's heaven right now heaven right now but yet sometimes because we have a, 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 a kind of a, a wanting more kind of attitude that kind of leads us to discontentment. So they had it all and they were complaining. They never stopped complaining. Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance of their entrance. Now this is the children of Israel. How childish, you know. They were wailing. You are soaked in their tears. Why? Because... They haven't eaten cucumber. <laughs> All right. The Lord became exceedingly angry and Moses was troubled. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servants? He went to God, right? Why did you bring this trouble on your servants? What have I done to displease you that you put this burden of all these people on me? Moses. Oh, poor Moses. Did I conceive all these people? Did I conceive them? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms? As a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors. <laughs> Where can I get meat for all these people, God? Why keep wailing to me? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I found any favor in your eyes, and do not let my uh, me um, sorry, do not let me face my own ruin. Seriously, seriously, it's like right now, God, death is more preferable than life with these people. <laughs> You know, he almost like reflects the picture and the image of their complaint. You know, he, the examples he's using is that of little children. That this is actually what children do. You know, in the midst, they have the best toy, but just because, you know, you give a little different one to, you know, maybe their, their other friend, and then all of a sudden, oh, mm, he has that one and he's happy. Maybe that is a better one. And you want to get it. That sometimes, you know, this kind of, you know, complaining and everything can only make us look childish and like little kids. And Moses kind of carried that and he reflected that. Now the difference here is that, you know, he complained to the right person. He complained to the right source. He did 
what was right. Because there is a right where we can complain. Not like the children of Israel like that will complain to one another. They complain to one another and infiltrated each other's minds and heart and filled it with negativity. When Moses has an issue, he took it to the right source. He took it to God and says, because sometimes we genuinely are frustrated about situations, about things that are not right. But the question is, how do we go about venting and releasing that frustration? That we don't, we don't need to take it around with us, but we take it to someone that can actually change the situation. Not to one another. Now, uh, I think it, it was uh, David that says, Attend to me and answer me. I am troubled in my complaint. I am troubled in my complaint. So attend to me. We complain vertically to God. That's why you have the book of lamentation. Where people just lament about how things are not working right. But you lament it to the person that can actually make a difference. How easy it can become a habit for us to complain. How easy. I remember the story of this farmer that likes, he is famous in his neighborhood for complaining. So every year people will gather around him, you know, when it was time for planting and harvest and all that, they will come to him and say, hey, old man, what do you think of this year? He's like, oh, mm -mm. horrible, horrible year. Too much rain, too much rain, all the crops in the ground are gonna rot. Then all right, okay. The following year they will come again, you know, and ask him, what do you think of this year? Oh, gosh, too dry, <laughs> too dry. All these plants, they're just all these crops, they're all, just, they're all gonna dry up, it's too dry. And then there was a perfect year, perfect weather conditions for plants and everything. And they harvested loads of crops and they are like, what? Is he going to say this time around if you ask him what he thinks of the year? We've had a very bountiful and successful year. And then they came to him and they asked, So, what do you think of this year? Oh my goodness. They were all impressed by this guy. He put his hand on his head, shook his head, and he was like, All this harvest, all this harvest, is surely have drained all the nutrients in the soil. <laughs> so there is always something. There is always something. And here we are so good, we do probably the same thing with the weather. Oh, winter, oh my goodness, winter, winter. I can't wait for the summer. And then a day of brightness, a day of 25 degrees, one, two, three days, four days. Oh, oh. <laughs> Couldn't sleep last night. The heat. The heat. And in some instance, some say it's not enough. And you say, I'm from Africa. We have 35 degrees there. Oh, take me there. Take me to Africa. You must love it. I'm like, no. This is why I'm here. It's too hot. I can't breathe at home. You know, so there is no perfect condition. Is it that we're in perfection for too long? Or oh, we're in imperfection for so long? There is always something in the background to discuss. Now the next thing we will look at, what to do when there's actually something to complain about? So, when I was a teenager, 
teenager, I'd say I was very carefree. I was very adventurous. I was never in the house. Um, I was always out and about on the street. I knew everyone up my road. I had a friend that lived around the corner. So if my mum needed to find me, she would probably go knock on that friend's door. We didn't really have mobiles back then. I'm not that old, but still, it was changed. <laughs> and I was very carefree. I was very sporty. I didn't really have a lot of issues. And I remember my mum sitting me down one day talking to me about her family history of mental illness. And I remember thinking in my head, I, that, how could that ever happen to me? Like, I would never get to the point where I would want to take my own life. I would never get to the point where, you know, life seemed bleak because I was very happy-go-lucky, very kind of excitable, just like I am now, but without the mental illness. And I think something out of the blue, um, when I got into my 20s, like during uni, um, there'd always been like an undercurrent that I wasn't aware of. But when I got to university and the final year of studying, I got really ill. Like I, I just got ill. There was not really an explanation. I had a terrible stomach bug. And ever since my stomach bug, my brain just did not function the same way. And I remember having all these aching joints. I kept going back and forth to the doctors, like, what is going on? What is happening? There were so many questions, so many things in the back of my head, like, God, why, why are you letting this happen to me? I stopped doing my sport. I couldn't go to the gym. I couldn't even, like, I used to be able to max out the leg weights. I was very strong. I couldn't even push, like, 40 kg on my legs. And I remember just crying and crying, God, what is happening to me? And my brain started, you know, I started to get really anxious. I couldn't stand up um, in front of people. I didn't even want to walk to, to uni by myself because I was afraid of... Um, of being alone and I, I wanted to go with someone and um, even at night like I couldn't get to sleep and I've never had problems um, with my sleep before so I remember thinking God God what is happening and I it wasn't until probably I got engaged to Nanzir and I really had to start looking in at myself and at, as a person who am I um, and how am I going to be a wife for Nanzir how am I going to be a mother um, that I started to really questioning, you know, what is this thing I'm carrying? But when I got pregnant, um, things went a bit out of control at the end of my pregnancy, and there was not really another explanation. The doctor said maybe hormones has happened in pregnancy. Um, if you have a history of kind of some mental illness, you can, it can get worse during pregnancy. And I remember probably one January, it was like in the January before I gave birth in March, just, I just couldn't, I couldn't function. And Nancy was really worried, like he didn't know what was wrong with me. My brain, every like 30 seconds, if not more, I would have these like terrible intrusive thoughts in my mind that I couldn't control. It wasn't like I was thinking them up myself. You know how we have our thoughts, we decide, we choose, we can say, God, like, I don't really want that thought. It was like terrible intrusive thoughts. And every 30 seconds, some for days, for days, so I stayed inside, I cried all the time. I was like, and I was crying out to God. God, why is this happening? Like, I feel emotional talking about it because it was so dark. And Nancy took me along to everything in that period. I started coming to church every night because I couldn't sit at home alone. Nancy was involved in worship. Nancy was involved in CGC and leading things in cell group. And I physically couldn't stay at home because I, I was scared. And so I, I'd come to church and I'd sit there and I might scribble. But I had to keep myself busy because it was like something had happened in my mind that I couldn't explain. And I think there were times, definitely, definitely, that I complained, and Nanzit just had to hold me and say, look, it's okay, it's okay. We don't understand what's happening, but, but that, that is all right. Um, and I would say, but why me? God, why let this happen to me? I'm someone who loves life. Like, I don't want this to be going on with me because I want to be able to think clearly. I want to be able to stand up and talk to a group of people. I want to do my job because I couldn't, I couldn't go back to work for a time. And um, I had to keep missing work because I couldn't be around people, a certain group of people or in a certain situation because it would trigger the thoughts and then I'd start crying. And my work, like, well, like what's going on with Becky? What, you know, she's not normally like this. And it got to a point then, just before I was due to give birth, where I was meant to have my baby shower and that night I just had this terrible anxiety attack and Nanzip had to rush me to hospital because I, I was afraid for my life. Like it was that bad that I was afraid. And, they kind of strung me up to all these things. I fainted in hospital. I had no idea what was going on. And Nanzip had to leave me. And Nanzip actually got really upset. That's probably the first time I've seen him 
crying one of the first times. Um, he just didn't know how to handle it. And I think in that moment, in, in that season, I really felt like this was going to last forever. Like I was stuck there. Like God had just left me. God wasn't providing. And when I came through the season and out the other side, I think I can now, I can look back. And even during the season, yes, I was, I was leaning on God. I was coming to church. I, that was the only place I felt safe, actually. And, you know, you guys, actually, those that were here, did me so much, you know, loved me so much, cared for me so much in that time that that enabled me to keep going. And that was the provision. That was my what is it. My mental health was something that God allowed to happen because I've prayed, you know, I pray all the time that God would come and heal me. And I believe that he has healed me. I'm still experiencing the symptoms of a mental illness, but I am healed. Amen. I am healed because I have Jesus inside me. And I, he, God has given me exactly what I need to manage this mental illness. God has given me doctors. God has given me therapists. God has given me a husband that is willing to learn and read and understand my condition. He's given me a family who have had a history of mental illness who also understand it, and a mum that struggles with very similar things. He's given me a church that is understanding, who sit by me, who let me cry, who support me, who pray for me. And he's also given me a work that relates to mental illness. I now, I work with young people. I go into schools and I sit with them, and many of the girls I talk to struggle with anxiety, struggle with OCD, struggle with depression, struggle with self-harm. Some have tried to take their own life. And if I hadn't experienced this, if I didn't have, if this wasn't my burden to carry, I would not, without a shadow of a doubt, I would not be able to sit there and speak directly into their lives from a godly perspective. Because I wouldn't understand. You know, people that don't experience what I experience wouldn't understand. You might be sitting there thinking, okay, yeah, I get what she's saying, but that's not my portion to carry, and that's okay. You've got your what is it. Whatever God has put in your life, it might be a provision. It might actually be a really good, something that actually is really good, but it's like, what do I do with this? It might be, um, yeah, it could be an illness, but it could be, I don't know, something you're good at. An ability that maybe you're like, okay, this is my what is it, but I need to, how do I drive this? What do I do with this ability that God's given me? But for me, actually, now, I look at my mental health as a gift from God. And I would say now, even with mental illness, I am in a better state mentally than I was when I didn't understand it and I didn't experience the symptoms because I'm consistently aware of it, because I constantly pray for it and seek God's will on it, I read about it. I'm happier and I'm more joyful because in those moments when I'm really low, I, I sit and I say to God, then let, you know, I'm low right now, God, and that's okay. But I know maybe tomorrow I won't be low anymore. So in the low, am I going to look to God? Am I going to draw near to him? Am I going to rejoice? It's actually in those times that worship is so key. And that's what we're going to talk about in our conclusion. Like, what do we do with our afflictions? Because if we can't look to God as the source, if we look in our, into ourselves and say, okay, this is the, it's me that needs to get through this. It's me who's been dealt with this. Then we do start complaining. We try and do it in our own power. This wasn't, I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't have this, I shouldn't be carrying this, why is this come on me? And yeah, there are times when I say that. But God has taught me that acceptance of what has happened and he's allowed to happen. If he wanted to heal me, you know, physically and in my brain, he could have healed me. But he's healed me in another way. And so it's a blessing. I count it as a blessing and I rejoice. And rejoicing is so important. If we can rejoice in the things that God has given us, and not complain, then we are more at peace, we are happy, we are joyful, Amen. we have a reason to live, we're not like the Israelites who are complaining to one another, who are getting wrapped up in their, their own suffering, and it's unnecessary. And I think, I want you to think about today what your what is it is, what is the what is it that God has given to you, what is that manner? God has given you, in the, whether it's in a season of darkness, whether it is the darkness itself that you need, you know, to push through or to learn something, to grow, because often in those seasons that's when we grow the most. 
what is the thing that you tend to find yourself complaining about when actually it is actually a blessing? And when we complain, it stifles the joy of the present, isn't it? It stops that joy from being able to take hold and to live in it. So there's a wonderful verse in Psalm 118, and we often sing it in church. You might remember, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. So can we rejoice, not just on a Sunday when we're singing that song in church, but can we rejoice on a Monday? Can, can that be the day? Can Monday be the day? Not just Sunday. Can Tuesday, can Wednesday, can Thursday? Can the day when you lose your job be the day that you rejoice? The day you get diagnosed with an illness or the day that you, yeah, the day you, I don't know, a pot of money lands in your lap. Not just a Sunday when you're here in church and not just when you feel like, okay, I, you know, today I feel like rejoicing because it's a good day. One of my best friends, just to finish, one of my best friends, who's not a Christian, called me a while ago and said, look, this is, this is what's happening to me. And it was exactly the same symptoms as I had had. And she's not a Christian. I've walked through, I've prayed for her for years. Like, God, give me, give me a reason to be able to speak Christ to this girl. Please, God, please. Since, you know, I've known her since year seven, since I was 11 and I'm 28. That's a good number of years. And it wasn't until this year, just, that she called me and explained to me what all the, the mental stuff she was going through and how she, you know, there's times when she wants to, to be dead. And I said to her, look, you're, you know, you're feeling like this, but there is a way out. And I prayed with her, and she was going through a really tough time with her family and with a loss and all sorts of things. And do you know what? That was the moment I think I clicked, as well as working with young people, but that moment was when she said to me of her own accord, God has spoken to me. God, the, this has happened. God has put you in my life for this very, very moment. And it, I, I got so emotional because I was like, God, wow, all those tears, everything that has happened is for this girl because you love this girl and you love me too and you're not going to let me, you're not going to see me go down the wayside. No. You have my back, God. God has your back. God wants you to rejoice. God wants you to take heed of every single thing he's given you and use it for his glory. It's not really about us, is it? It's the Israelites, yeah, they're, they're here, they're looking back, but actually, the, in that moment, could they find joy in that present moment? Like, wow, God, you put food in our laps. There's even another bit, I don't think we read, where God showers them with meat. Quail fall from the sky, and they have meat to eat. You know, and if they have sat and just sat in that moment and said, wow, this is incredible, then maybe God would have not been angry, not wanted to wipe them out. He did show some mercy, but still, maybe they'd have got to the promised land a lot quicker than 40 years. They were meant to get there in about six, was it, how many days? 40 days. And they got there in 40 years. And a lot of it was just because of their attitude. We have a choice. We all have a choice. I have a choice. I still have a choice every day. Do I want to complain? Do I want to think, oh, this is it for me. I'm stuck here. I would never, I, I would never have been able to stand up here and talk to you only by the grace of God because I really struggle with social anxiety and actually for me standing here is such a blessing. So the final, the final conclusion, some questions for you. What has God provided and is provided that we are taking for granted even though it is enough to get us through? So that's something I spoke to you earlier about. What, what is God providing for you personally? What is your heart speaking to you that could help you break from the circle of negativity so you can enjoy God's abundance all around? So that's that inner, you know, the spirit of God. What is he saying to you right now? You know the strongholds. You know the things that get in the way. You know what makes you complain, the things you get annoyed about. But what is God, what is God saying to you right now? And finally, what kind of friends do you need to give arm's length to to help deal with discontentment? And on that other hand, what people do you need to bring closer to champion you? 
because in that season, the Israelites, it was the rabble, you know, in, in my verse, I don't know if you can pop that in my first verse, with the rabble. The rabble with them began to crave other food. So it's the other people around them, maybe the people that had into, you know, married and connected, they might not have been Israelites, but they came along with them. And those people influenced them and they started complaining to one another. And actually we are influenced by the people around us. And maybe God's saying to you, you know, if you're around people who are complaining all the time, then you're, you've got to be the one that changes that atmosphere because they're probably not going to. Maybe you can even have a conversation with them. But maybe you need to think really, like, honestly with yourself about whether they're the right kind of people to always be around. God wants you to love them, of course, but if, you know, if, if it's affecting you, then you need to think, okay, how, how is this affecting me and what, what can I do about that and pray for that person. I think that's everything I've got. Do you want to say something? So let all that have that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He, for, he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. So we have a future. There is a past that we know about. But the life here in the middle, what are we going to choose to fill it with? Gratitude or complaining? Amen. That's the last point. Uh, there is a picture that Becky put here. You guys must be wondering. <laughs> That's the future. <laughs> the future is bright. Thank you all. Thank you. If you feel you need to pray after this service, who would you love to pray with you? Because sometimes we are stuck in the negativity and we need someone else alongside to come and to help us and to break the holes, you know, and to help us to see different perspectives. And also Tuesdays, if you watch a session of Inner Healing, Veronica and myself will be here in the church to, to help people, spend time with the people and do some Inner Healing. And it, yes, feel free, it's for free. We are not, we do not charge anyone. We, we are here just to, to help, to encourage people. And please let us know if you want one session of Inner Healing on Tuesday. But before we finish here, I think because I forgot in the beginning, there is a testimony that we want to share with you guys. You know, how faithful is our God? When they were saying, Nazif, there is a John from here to there. You know, this is a John. And in this John here is a time where God is stretching us. It's a time where God is teaching us. It's a time where God is building our faith. Because we need to, this faith to get there. You know, if you wish to with the faith when we left here, we will not be able to get there because every day is a new step, it's a new level of faith. And to get here, we, we need to walk the walk, you know, because if not, we will not be able to get to this point. And I, I want to invite Saul here. You know, I love God. And our God is faithful God. He's is a, a God of promise and he fulfills his promise. And I think all of you know the situation of Saul, how he came here, he came to see face. We provide the visa for him. And yeah, there was this big issue. Issue that a little issue, but we have seen God breaking free in some areas. That is the reason that I want to Saul to share here, to encourage you to know that God is faithful. God is faithful when he say, go and he'll back you up. When he, he, he tell you something, do not be scared because he'll provide for you whatever you need. Yeah. With it, it's because the time has gone. Yeah, just to contextualize for those who don't know, I'm Brazilian, I'm Saulo, and I came here as a missionary. I felt like last year God calling me back to England and first, I didn't have like the money for a visa or anything because 
But right now it's a thousand pound for us to get here for two years. But then God provided the whole thing. And to actually come here was a challenge in itself because I got a standby ticket to get here. That means I go to the airport, not knowing if I get on the plane because if there's vacancy, I will get there. If there's a spot, I get there. If not, no. So I go to the airport to get a plane, not knowing if I get a plane. And as I'm there, there was no place for me to stay yet. I was like going to a plane or going to an airport without knowing if I get a plane, to go to a country not knowing if I'll get a place to sleep, not knowing the money or anything and how it would work out. Went in, got the first flight. As I was in the flight, there was a place provided for me. During the day, the first day I was here, a second place appeared, so I had choice. And from the day until today, nothing. I, I lacked nothing. But then, there was a new challenge. I'm getting married on the 24th of August, and of course I want to bring my wife. And as I said, the visa would be a thousand pounds. And since I came here, I'm, I, I can't work. So I'm just like relying on offerings, you know, and things like that. And God has been provided, been faithful every single day. But how can you just get a thousand pounds? You know, so I've been praying about it. My cell group knows a lot about it. Every every Tuesday, I share with them. Like my closer friends know that as well. I've been talking to them, pray about it because we need that. And the time was arriving. We had to apply until this next week because otherwise it would affect the wedding and everything, honeymoon, and it would just be a mess. And this past week, as we prayed and and, and asked God for direction. We, on this Thursday, we got an offering wow. for a thousand pounds. Wow. And that just paid everything. The time is right. And I'm able to bring her. You know? And as Eva said, when God calls you, He provides. Amen. You have to step in faith, not knowing what's going to happen, not knowing how it's going to unfold, but it will. I'm here and I get emotional. I'm a very cry person, though. So. <laughs> but. It's just amazing to see how God does, you know? When you're in obedience, He will provide. So don't be afraid. If He calls you somewhere else, just go, because He will provide. Don't be afraid to quit the job to go somewhere else, because He will provide. Don't be afraid. He is the provider. Amen. He is the provider. And I have like a penny since I got here. And I have more than enough. I don't have anything like to, to just like throw away. But I never lack anything, any single thing. And I know God's still going to do amazing things, you know, and just be encouraged to, to do and to be where he wants you to be because he's faithful. If you know anyone else who has an extra bedroom and want to rent for a couple, we are looking for a bedroom for them because... A flat would be better, yeah. but a room yes. it would do. Yes, it would be good as well. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have your house, if you know someone else, you know, they'll need a place. When he brings his wife, he needs a place for them to stay. They'll be working for the time. Yes. Okay? For the church, sorry. Yes. That's it. Thank you. Let's yeah. for God's good. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ways that you reward God. I found so beautiful. Sometimes we, we do not know how you are leading, how things that is, is ahead of us. And then sometimes as a human, we become a little bit scared because sometimes we are not experienced in faith. We haven't seen breaking through and then we can be a bit scared. But Father, I thank you because this is a beautiful journey. It's a journey that we learn with you. It's a journey that we see your hand being manifest and breaking free and change the situation. And God, I thank you as back and as if you were sharing, even through all the things that you back you went through, God. And you, you, you are using her to reach out Young people, and also about her friend's testimony. If it was only for her friend, God, it was worth it. And I thank you because our troubles, our difficulties, God, it you, it you bring a wage for us, it you bring the result. It's not that you want us to suffer or you leave us in a situation to suffer or you are cursing us. It's not about that. God, we thank you because we are in a training. You are training us, you are strengthening our spiritual muscles, you are strengthening us to be the people that you called us to be. You are preparing us.
as you fulfill our destiny, God. And I thank you for your ways. Your ways are great. Your ways are powerful. Your ways are is amazing. And Father, I thank you. And I, I really pray that you help us. When the, the challenges come, Father, we will not despair. We will not run. We will not give up. We will not shrink back. But we will, we will stay firm. We will stand firm with you, God. Knowing that you are God. Knowing that you are faithful. And knowing that you get us through any circumstance. Yes. I thank you and I honor you. Thank for the provision for Saul's money. Thank for the person who was the answer of our prayers, God. We bless them. And thank you for what you are going to do as well. Thank you for every single person, our friends, who are visiting us today. We bless them, God. We pray for your favor upon their lives. We pray that they will know you, those who do not know you. They will know your love. They will know your power. They will know the cross of Jesus and what it has achieved for each one of us. Bless us during this week, God. I pray for our week of victory, our week of breaking through, our week that we will be able to stand for you and for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.